wandering aimlessly. Qu quite wise walking about in a day like this with a flipping hoodie on with the hood up, I just don't know. Okay, so welcome back. We are just coming through Castle Douglas now. We're just going to head towards Dalbiti and go up that road there. It should be a little bit quieter and it's got some lovely scenery. It's one of my favourite roads, favourite main roads in the area because it has some lovely long sweeping bends and just in, it's just, it's really enjoyable to ride provided it's not too busy. in the way back so that we could take the wee man up to Granny's tonight. Go and stay with his Granny and Papa for a night. Oh. Oof, TB. Road condition doesn't get any better. Roadworks, maybe they're fixing potholes. You never know your luck. Nope, they're putting in a pipeline. Too much to hope for. I don't know why people do that. The stop, the light's clearly still at red, but you have to creep forward a little bit. Gain that extra three feet. Don't, put, don't know what they think it's going to achieve. Drives me nuts in a motorbike, the people that stop way back and then creep forward. Because you end up having to paddle it forward. No consideration, that's why I say. Fixing the electricity wires. Here we are, right over the hill to Dalbiti. windy again, that's just what we have to put up with in this area, but other than that, it's absolutely gorgeous. I actually, a couple of days ago, my wife and I, my wife was off, so we actually managed to have a little time just chilling out in the garden, sitting in the back, the decking round the back, getting the sunshine, it was absolutely gorgeous, getting us ready for a holiday.
get a little start in the suntan. Being Scottish, we tend to not so much tan as go red and peel and go white again. <laughs> but uh, for some reason, the sun gets goes brown as a berry. It's down to his, my wife's got a fairly mixed ancestry, including Spanish, and her father goes properly brown and I think the wee man's picked up his DNA so that's not a bad thing hopefully picks up his grandpa's DNA as far as hairline goes because otherwise he'll end up looking like me a bit of a billiard ball I'll go past this fella, might as well here, but the car broken down, not a great place to break down, she's quite in bloody firewood, honest to god, people coming the other way, it's just over the prow of a hill, it's really not a good place to stop. It's lovely. Ride along, get views like that for free. Oh, gravel, 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 slippy, slippy, slippy. Spoiled somewhat by the mobile phone mast up ahead, but I guess we need signal. Can't really complain, I'm one of the first to moan when I don't get signal in my phone. There you go, who needs the stale fuel pass, eh? gravel in this bit of road. I think the road surface is actually breaking up. Maybe they'll fix it, maybe they won't. No doubt if they do fix it, it'll be closed for six months.
No, oh, come on. That's the game. Don't have, like having to admit defeat and put my feet down. Daviti, another little picturesque place. I lived in Daviti for about eight or nine months. It's very nice, people are lovely. Now that I'm getting older, and my wife reckons that I'm going to get bored, uh, fat chance. Um, there is a man shed here where old codgers like myself can come along, share our tips, make stuff, chat. Um, and apparently the Dalbiti one is very good, so she's suggesting that I go and inquire about it, but I'm not there yet. It's not that I'm not old enough, I am, but uh, I've got plenty to do with my time. And usually what I find with organisations like that, it suddenly find that something that you do to fill your time suddenly fills your time to excess, and that's not the point of retiring. The point of retiring to me is do what you want, when you want, and not have to worry about time or just to have as little stress as possible. Ooh. And another one, there we go. We don't need stress in our lives. Feeling adventurous, there's a zoom past him there, but uh, there's no point. Plenty of other chances. There's somebody over there on the left got a, their own little domestic windmill. I don't know how effective they are. One of the things that sounds like a good idea if you live in the right place, but I don't know how effective they are, and how much, how long it takes to get your money back. But I'm all for green energy, a great exponent of getting things from nature if we can, as long as it doesn't detract from nature. So obviously, coal mining is something that very much detracts from nature in terms of when they extract it when we burn it and we're depleting the Earth's natural resources and I know it's coal's probably not used for anything else for the Earth but it just, it just seems wrong we're changing the state of matter wind is free ooh, and there's a lot of it today and so are waves, so let's use it to generate the electricity that we need. I'm told that Scottish electricity generation is predominantly wind and water powered. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it would be nice to think it is. stupid Scottish government, although I'm 100% Scottish by DNA, I, I'm not a raving nationalist, I don't think there's any great advantage to being stuck in our own, a tiny country of 5 million people, I don't think there's a great advantage in going it alone, but the Scottish government are, and I voted against dev uh, devolution, I have voted against the instigation of a Scottish Parliament and it, it didn't do any good. We now have a Scottish Parliament, at least we're not independent. 
because they seem to be a complete bunch of numbskulls. They seem to view it as a competition. The case in point, they said, the rest of the country said we're aiming to be carbon neutral by 2035. The Scottish Minister said we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030. And then gave no thought to how that could be managed. And so they've had to go back in their word. They seem to think that it's a competition. Oh, well, we can do this. You can do this, so we'll go do it better. It makes no sense. And then half of them seem to be in court for embezzlement and misappropriation of funds. And as Burns would put it, it's like a parcel of rogues in a nation. Things haven't changed since Burns was alive. Anyway, not getting too political. I am 100% Scottish, as I said, based on one of these DNA kits you get through the post. So, I'm sure there's not many of us. There can be even less of us, I would imagine, that don't want to be independent from the rest of Britain. I take the mickey something rotten out of some of my English friends, but uh, they take the mickey right back, so it's all in good fun. There's no malice intended. So much for me saying this road's going to be quieter. I'm getting hungry. Just head back to the house, get something to eat. a rake about in the cupboards and see what there is. It's Friday so it's the end of the week. Supplies are getting thin on the ground. As you may or may not be aware, in Scotland HGVs, so vehicles over 7.5 tonne, are restricted to 40 miles an hour. The rest of the country is 50, which I think is reasonable, but in Scotland, taking me back to my previous comments about the Scottish Parliament, we've decided to make it 40. Now that actually does cause sometimes quite a bit of a tailback behind a lorry because you can see the opportunities for overtaking are somewhat limited. Even on a quick bike, the opportunities for overtaking are limited. So, I would argue that 40 mile an hour for wagons is actually dangerous because it causes frustration with the drivers who perhaps overtake where they shouldn't. And, uh, yeah, and, and lead to accidents. So, yeah, once again, Scottish Government mess things up. Don't think things through. In their ivory towers in Edinburgh. Granite towers, I suppose. <laughs> So I was going to tell you some funny stories and I've been waxing on about politics and my dislike of them. So as I said before, 
I don't know whether this is going to be in this video or I may do it in a second video but I worked for various Scottish local authorities for the guts of 30 years and uh, I was an environmental health officer. Now everybody thinks an environmental health officer is we inspect food places and that's about it. Uh, it's very much not the case, that's only a very small part of the duties of environmental health. The name itself gives you a clue as to what it in involves, so the environment is everything that affects you, so the food you eat is obviously part of it, water you drink, air you breathe, homes you live in, places you work, all comes under environmental health banner. So my least favourite job was inspecting food places, but I do have some funny stories about those. And my favourite job was when I worked for a public health team. So public health covered everything from housing, noise pollution, air pollution, water pollution, the, the whole gambit. And that was by far and away the most interesting part of the job. So public health also involves what we call communicable diseases. That is a diseases that are spread usually by some kind of vector that environmental health have legislative control over. So food poisoning is one of them. And we used to get lots of food poisoning complaints, not all of them necessarily accurate. People don't understand that if you go out and have 15 pints in a curry, it's not always going to be the curry that gives you the diarrhea. But trying to convince them of that's another story. So what we've got is a, oh, a, a massive, a massive range of different food poisoning organisms, some of which don't have any effect on you for up to 14 days. So the last thing you ate isn't always the thing that's giving you food poisoning. In fact, if you have diarrhea, it's very unlikely to be the last thing that you've eaten because it's not had time to go through your system. So, little story. Environmental Health are responsible for investigating cases of suspected food poisoning to find out where it came from, if it perhaps came from a, a restaurant or something like that. And so, when somebody is confirmed to have a food poisoning organism through a positive test through the doctors or something like that, uh, we will investigate. And what that involves is going to see the person, interviewing them, and trying to get as much of a food history as as we can. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggled to remember what I ate for dinner last night, never mind what I ate a fortnight ago. But we are trying to find as much as we possibly can. Particularly things that are out of the ordinary, or things that a person has eaten that nobody else has eaten, or things that have been eaten and in common with other people that are ill. So we get the food history and we get we give them a little sample kit. It's a fecal sample kit. It's a little clear plastic tube with a screw on lid. And stuck into the lid is a little spoon. I'll, I'll leave the, the rest to your imagination, but we need a sample of your poop. And we send that away and we can confirm what type of food poisoning you may or may not have and if it is something like let's say salmonella we can phage type it which allows us to get the distinct species of salmonella and that lets us trace it if we're taking samples from a restaurant or something like that so it could be you know we could end up with something like salmonella entered into this phage type 4 if we go to a restaurant and find different phage types, then we can quite comfortably say that is not the cause. 
So one of these occasions, I had to travel now by car, the journey is about an hour, up single track roads, away in the back and beyond, to go and see this old lady who had food poisoning. So did the usual, got her food history as best as I could, um, gave her the faecal sample kit, which we lovingly called shit kits, and left it at that. About a week later, the lady turns up at the desk with, ostensibly, her shit kit back, and she handed over to the receptionist a rather weighty brown paper envelope and then also proceeded to hand her separately an unused chip kit. She says, I didn't know what to do with that. So it turns out that this lady had, thankfully she was better and she was over her diarrhea, um, but she had deposited her um, sample, let's say, a log, into the envelope, travelled by bus, and by bus the journey was probably closer to an hour and a half to two hours, with a turd in a bag. I'm sure she had a seat all on her own. But it did make us laugh. We didn't tell the poor old lady that she had done it wrongly. We didn't think that was particularly fair. And we got the student to go into the envelope and take a scoop from from the log. Well, that's what students are for after all. We had another one just kind of in the same vein, seeing as I'm talking poop. We had As a, as a department, we gave away dog poop bags so that trying, trying to reduce the amount of dog crap in the area so the council paid for the bags and gave them away free and I remember I happened to be at the reception desk for something else and this lady came in and I have never seen someone more red in the face and more angry in all my life and it turned out that she had been given some of the free dog poop bags, which were fairly heavy, red plastic, and it was just a tube of plastic sealed at one end. There had been a manufacturing fault, and they weren't sealed, so basically the woman had a tube of plastic, which she put her hand through to lift up her dog poop, and had a nice squelchy, unpleasant feeling through her fingers. And I don't know how I managed not to laugh. Poor woman. I do feel sorry for her, but it was extremely funny when it's not you. But at least I suppose it stopped her biting her nails. Yeah, I'm going to get petrol. Ooh, your door's not shut, pal. a wee bit from him, because something rolls out. <laughs> <laughs> 